translators. It's a great honor to welcome you all back to the fourth biannual United States China Consumer Product Safety Summit. I'm Alex Phillip. I'm Deputy Director of the Office of Communications at CPSC. A couple of housekeeping things. In case of emergency, the exits are on the left and on the right here. Go out to the main lobby. Lobby exit to the uh, outside in case of emergency. There's also an exit in the back. You take the stairs down to the courtyard and uh, exit the building that way. Yesterday provided a very interesting look at the improvements, the remaining challenges, and the potential for cooperation between our countries in the area of consumer product safety. Our speakers and our discussions were absolutely first rate, and I think you'll find this morning's program just as worthwhile. Now at this point, I would like to reintroduce you to our leaders the, of the two delegations that are here today, CPSC Chairman Inez Tenenbaum, AQSIQ Vice Minister Sun Dun Wei, Chairman, Vice Minister, would you mind standing for a moment? But thank you. If you've been following the theme of the summit, you will have noticed an emphasis on globally accepted best practices. Our panel this morning continues that theme with a discussion of global best practices to tracking and traceability. The ability for manufacturers, consumers, and regulators to know with certainty how to identify hazardous product or component, how to isolate it and how many there are, and how, uh, and how to have the facts on hand in a very rapid time frame. This all depends on having some sort of effective tracking and traceability system in place. This is a topic of growing importance to all stakeholders and the subject of a pilot project within the International Consumer Product Safety Caucus, the Global Consumer Product Regulatory Group. Andy Cameros uh, will moderate our uh, panel this morning. There he is. <laughs> okay. Andy is Assistant Executive Director of Compliance and has extensive experience enforcing federal regulations. He worked for 19 years as federal prosecutor for the criminal uh, section of the tax division of the U.S. Department of Justice, where he led a team of attorneys and agents in the investigation and prosecution of complex financial crimes, focusing primarily on tax fraud and mail and wire fraud schemes. Andy will introduce us to his panel. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chairman, uh, Vice Minister. Um, I thought that before we got into the substance of our, our panelist discussion, I'd uh, provide a little bit of background on the <clears throat> tracking label and registration card uh, requirements to provide some context uh, for, their <clears throat> for their presentations. Section 103 of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act is entitled Tracking Labels for Children's Products. It requires tracking labels to the extent practicable on all children's products and their packaging um, sufficient to enable the manufacturer and ultimate purchaser to ascertain um, certain source and production information. <clears throat> the information that's expected to be uh, on these tracking labels is the location uh, and the date of production, um, which can be the date the product was produced as well as um, the date of assembly. Uh, cohort information such as uh, lot, batch, run numbers, uh, and other information which <clears throat> facilitates the ascertaining the source of the product. Uh, now this tracking label requirement applies to children's products which are defined as a consumer product designed or intended primarily for children 12 years of age or younger. Uh, the tracking label requirement became effective in August of um, 2009 and both manufacturers and importers are responsible for compliance with the tracking label requirement. Um, as I mentioned, one purpose of this requirement is to assist the manufacturers in determining the origin of a defective product, 
uh, and the cause of the re recall so that these products can be isolated and repaired uh, or destroyed. Um, it's also expected that manufacturer location and date of production information on a tracking label will enhance uh, the product identification and assist the consumer in determining whether a product they own has been the subject of a recall. Um, the section requires permanent distinguishing marks, but doesn't specify uh, what those marks are to look like. That's pretty much left to the discretion uh, of the manufacturer, and it's our view that manufacturers will use their best judgment uh, in developing markings that best suit um, their business and their products. Uh, uh, each manufacturer is expected to use reasonable judgment in deciding what information to include on the label, <clears throat> and uh, in determining reasonableness, the CPSC uh, will look to the individual manufacturer's uh, uh, situation along with the practices of, of peer manufacturers. Uh, now, the Commission recognizes that there are certain products that don't lend themselves uh, easily to the affixing of uh, a tracking label or other mark. Um, for example, there are products that are just too small to accept a tracking label. There are products uh, that are pieces of a, a board game or, um, uh, or other uh, uh, combination of, of products. There are products for which a tracking label might do damage to the product itself or might affect the aesthetics of the product. In those instances, uh, we would consider uh, labeling that's affixed to uh, the packaging of that product as uh, uh, compliant with Section 103 of the statute. Um, <clears throat> another requirement that addresses the issue of traceability is the registration cards that each manufacturer of a durable infant or toddler product must provide with the product. Um, manufacturers are required to provide a postage, uh, prepaid consumer registration form with each product that's sold. Uh, they need to keep records of the consumers who register their products and they have to permanently place the manufacturer's uh, name and contact information, model name and number, uh, and the date of manufacture on each uh, of those products. <clears throat> um, the CPSC expects that this rule uh, has and will greatly promote a higher rate of product registration and in turn provide better notification for product owners, thereby increasing the overall effectiveness of our recall process. Um, we have convened a distinguished panel today to discuss the CPSC's tracking label and traceability requirements. They'll be presenting the views of uh, manufacturers and industry, uh, as well as those of consumer groups regarding the efficacy uh, of these requirements and what can be done to uh, possibly improve uh, the labeling requirements and, and the compliance with uh, those requirements. Our first presenter is Randall Gooden. He's uh, recognized as a leading expert on product safety and product liability prevention. Uh, he's taught product safety, recall readiness, and product liability prevention seminars to thousands of manufacturers, uh, executives around the world. Uh, in fact, we were talking earlier, he told me that, uh, well, I've still got five years on his passport, it's full. So he's been, uh, he's been, he's been very busy um, uh, providing that kind of information to his clients. He's also authored several books focusing on reducing the risk of product liability, which have sold uh, thousands of copies worldwide. So, uh, Mr. Good. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real honor to be here and have this opportunity to speak with all of you, especially uh, our honorable Chinese delegation. Um, we're talking about, about uh, uh, traceability and what we talked about yesterday and, and what we're talking about today. Um, I wanted to show you a few slides here. I do, as it was, as it was uh, mentioned by Andrew, uh, do teach seminars all around the world on this to, to manufacturers. Um, and I just wanted to point out, in this one here, this was, this was sponsored by a CIQ branch. Uh, in, in, uh, it was in, held in Chengzhou, and because it was sponsored by the CIQ branch, we had over 200 manufacturers there uh, for the uh, seminar, including uh, 20 or 30 CIQ 
inspectors uh, were at the event. So it, it enabled a lot of manufacturers to come in and, and learn what they needed to uh, learn regarding this. And this one here was done in uh, Shanghai, and it was sponsored by the um, Shanghai Quality Association. So, but manufacturers all over the world, throughout the United States, Europe, everywhere, uh, are very interested in all, all of these topics, product safety. And how do you reduce the number of recalls uh, and the problems corporations can face, not only in recalls, but the ultimate failure of your product when it actually injures somebody, causes property damage, and you could even face a product liability lawsuit. So we take it right to the end and uh, what we're focusing on. And, and, yet, and these are the areas that we try to address, I try to address in all of the uh, seminars, all of these areas for the manufacturing management team uh, to be focused on in order to help prevent this, this possibility. Um, but it all starts in a design review. And, and yesterday's topic and today's topic, when we're talking about traceability, when, uh, we need to be discussing this as part of the design review. We're going to manufacture a new, new product it, it conceivably is going to have new component parts. It may have new suppliers. And we need to be able to trace where these things are coming from and, 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 and uh, monitor the, the movement of these uh, component parts, uh, uh, subcontracted uh, 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 assemblies and stuff that are going into this uh, final product. And, and although this is being required by, by the CPSIA, uh, for children's products, uh, this makes a lot of sense for anybody. You don't have to even be in consumer products. You don't have to just be in children's products or consumer products. I teach us to uh, industrial ma product manufacturers, commercial product manufacturers, because this is recall readiness. This is all part of learning at some later date that you have a problem with your product and being able to quickly isolate which products are affected by the problem. And so it makes really good sense for everybody to do it, even though CPSIA is just requesting that or requiring it for uh, children's products, but it should go well beyond that. But it all starts at the design review stage. How are we going to manufacture this product? What materials are we going to use? What component parts are we going to use? What, material, what suppliers are we going to use? And so in this, uh, and and uh, we're looking at here's our design review team and, and all of the things that the design review team, the much larger team of two teams in, in, in the original umbrella of design reviews. This is the, the regular design review team that's looking at all the manufacturing issues of this new product that we're going to manufacture. And what was talked about yesterday is handled by the uh, product safety team. They're focused on the hazards, smaller team. Looking at uh, a product safety team being two to four people, but the the uh, uh, for most manufacturing corporations, uh, the design review team consists of anything from eight to fifteen people in size, depending upon the complexity of the product that you're manufacturing. Um, and then in this stage, uh, when we're looking at the products and we're looking at the components, we're looking at how we're going to manufacture this, looking at the entire manufacturing process. How are we going to incorporate traceability into this so that we know when materials flow through the operation uh, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, we're able to, to, to mark when they made it to the assembly line and which finished products have certain batches of component parts that were received by certain suppliers on certain days. Now, one of the things when we're talking about the labeling <clears throat> One of the things that, uh, this is a, a label that I put together, and, 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 it, and it, what it's saying here is, here's the name of the company, here's where the company is located, and now it has this distinguishing mark on it that looks like a serial number, and it, and it functions just like a serial number, but in fact, it's not really a serial number. It's a time stamp. And so when the product is coming down the assembly line, and it makes it to the end of the assembly line, and the person who's there pushes a button on, on the label maker, uh, and, it, and it stamps this time on it. So in this situation here, 
that, that stamp says that this thing was made on April 15th of 09 uh, at 3.30 in the afternoon and 35 seconds. You're not going, it, it functions just like a serial number because you're not going to have two products that have the same number on it. How it's different than a serial number is if, it, if you put a serial number on a product, then you have to keep another set of records that, that uh, uh, states when you use that serial number uh, and when you applied it to a product. In this situation, you don't have to do that. Uh, in this situation, it's telling you all of that, but it's not only telling you that, it's telling, uh, if, if you find that the product uh, that you manufactured and that you've been manufacturing for uh, a number of days or even weeks, <clears throat> if you were to find that the product that was made uh, on April 15th of 09 somewhere between noon and, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon was defective for some reason, whether it was a, a, a defective shipment of incoming components or somebody in subassembly didn't do the job right, uh, and those are the ones we're identifying as being the, the uh, uh, materials that we need to recall. You can do that on here and everybody can understand it. The retailers can understand it, the consumers that have it, because all you would be doing is telling them that the ones that we're specifically looking for uh, are between 1200 and 1530. And if you have one of those, those are the ones that are subject to the recall. And so it was just an idea. But what we need to do as manufacturers, and again, I go back to this doesn't, this makes really good sense to do this to limit your exposure. If you don't trace the products, if you don't trace the component parts uh, in any type of a product that's being manufactured, then when you identify at some later date that you have a defective condition, uh, you're going to be facing having to recall all of the products because you have no way of distinguishing which final products those defective components or those defective materials uh, got into. And, and you don't know, and you can't distinguish those from the rest. So it makes really good sense for all manufacturers to do this. So if we're monitoring uh, when the raw materials came into our receiving dock, and, and say we're barcoding all shipments of product batches of component parts that came in, and we're scanning the barcoding labels, and we're following the movement through the various departments uh, within a manufacturing corporation and then we know exactly what time those things hit the assembly line. Then you go back to, here's our person down here pushing the, the, the uh, label maker button and hitting that timestamp as this is when this product was manufactured. And so therefore, if we have all the traceability systems built into the manufacturing process, we know exactly which ones we're looking for and we can identify them to everybody that's out there. If you have one of these, this is subject to the uh, uh, recall. After that, and, and after we've manufactured the process, then it becomes a, a, an, an issue of monitoring and watching what's going on uh, out, out with the uh, customers and the end users in the marketplace. The, the uh, phone calls, the uh, customer complaints to customer service and to sales and such as to, to um, bring into attention there, there's not only some products that uh, failed and, and, and they need to be uh, replaced, um, but understanding that, that uh, paying special attention to things that failed and could lead to an accident or injury. They didn't at that time uh, lead to an accident or injury, but they could at a future date. And how do you differentiate with your customer service people and anybody that's answering a phone, anybody that has correspondence uh, with outside parties, how do you differentiate between uh, those situations that at a later date could be a very serious uh, problem with a product versus, uh, and, and could lead to accident or injury versus just a product that, that quit working the way it was supposed to be working. Go back to, we talked yesterday, made a mention about Toyota. Akio Toyota had stated, the chairman of Toyota, had stated when he talked to Congress here in Washington, he says what the company failed to do was connect the dots. He said the flags were there. The people were saying that they're having problems with the cars with un unanticipated acceleration, 
and it was happening out throughout North America and throughout Europe. It was, what was going on was is that these calls were going to um, the sales department for North America and to Europe. And what they were doing was just taking care of those customers uh, that were complaining about the uh, cars uh, having a, their cars having a problem. And, and they were uh, taking care of them in the sense that they were just saying, bring the car into local dealership, we'll take a look at it. And the key is that the problem here is, is that the information never found its way back to Tokyo and to, to the, the uh, uh, engineering departments. Uh, that they could I, 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 uh, identify this and, and, and figure out what was happening here. And it didn't happen until we had a real crisis accident. Uh, so the information and the people need to be trained and we need to be monitoring uh, so that we catch these things and we identify real quickly if we have a potential problem with a product. Uh, and then we are ready to recall. Uh, that the corporation has the recall team in place uh, ready to spin into action instantly and, and, and working with the CPSC um, on stating what they're going to do and that they're all ready to do it. The key thing is, is to be addressing this, this situation and this product that's out there uh, very rapidly and being in, in, in a ready position to do it. But it goes back to you can't identify which product you're talking about unless you build traceability into the system. It's the best way to isolate. We're not talking about all of the product, unless we are talking about all the product, but we're not talking about all the product, we're talking about an isolated uh, uh, group of the product and here's how it's identified and here's what we're going to do and be able to spin into action in days or a week or two and get this product off of the market and be addressing it. So that's the key thing. It, it, it is to use this, and like I said, this is a very good system to have in this labeling and this following process uh, to, to uh, incorporate traceability right up in the design review, right when we're talking about this brand new product that we're going to manufacture, uh, the new suppliers and the new component parts, uh, and build traceability into the system regardless of what the product's for, but it has to be done naturally for the children's products, but it should be done for all products. Uh, to limit your exposure to potential uh, accidents. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gooden. Our next presenter is uh, Nancy Cowles. Ms. Cowles is the Executive Director of Kids in Danger, which is a nonprofit organization <clears throat> dedicated to protecting children by improving children's product safety. Prior to joining Kids in Danger, Ms. Cowell served as the Executive Director for the Coalition for Consumer Rights, a center for public interest research and education. Uh, Ms. Cowell has more than 30 years' experience in building and directing organizations which investigate a wide variety of consumer issues. Uh, Ms. Cowell. <laughs> Go. Good morning. I am the director of Kids in Danger. We're a nonprofit organization that works on children's product safety. Kids in Danger was founded in 1998 uh, by the parents of Danny. Um, Danny was killed in a recalled portable crib in childcare. Um, they found out after he died that the crib had been recalled five years before he died, that he was the fifth child to die in that particular brand of crib and the 12th child to die in cribs with the same mechanism that had been uh, patented and sold to other companies. So uh, of the 1.5 million cribs that were made with this defect, um, 1.2 are still today, what is it now, 14 years later, still unaccounted for. Um, and so um, our concern is very real for those of you at CPSC who wonder why I keep calling and bugging you about things. It's because I keep Danny's picture on my desk so that I remember the real price of unsafe products. The, we've talked a little bit about the tracking label requirement that is in the CPSIA. The portion that is in the uh, product registration cards is actually that requirement is named after Danny 
um, and his, uh, the efforts of his parents to assure that uh, what happened to him will not happen to other children. Um, we want to make sure that the information was not only on the packaging that could be used for shipping and for manufacturer's use, but was actually on the product itself, because uh, we all know with products that once they get into the home, and sometimes even before, the packaging is lost and put away, and, and to be useful to consumers, the information needs to be on the product itself. So we very strongly believe that the improved tracking and traceability will improve safety. Tracking labels and the product registration uh, system that Andy talked about are very important to make sure that consumers learn about a recall when it takes place and can actively participate in the recall because they know that the product they have is the one that either is involved in the recall or is not. In addition, uh, being able to trace components in, uh, of products as well as products also improves safety. We have seen numerous recalls of children's products where one particular product will be recalled only to be followed up sometimes months or even years later with products with the same component or same design that simply were not identified at the time of the initial recall. Um, this crib, the, the Graco branded Simplicity Crib, is a good example of the real impact of not having a tracking label. In 2005, Liam Johns in California, a nine-month-old boy, died in this Simplicity branded, or Graco branded Simplicity crib. This, the drop side rail came undone. He was caught and uh, strangled. They made a report to CPSC. The CPSC investigator had the model number uh, from the crib, went out, looked at the crib, but could not identify any Graco crib with that model number. So that was the end of the investigation. He, he felt it was a dead end, left the crib where it was, um, and did not go back to look at that particular crib until two years later when the Chicago Tribune started investigating deaths in Simplicity products and realized that, in fact, the model number was a Simplicity number, uh, but there was not Simplicity written anywhere on the crib. There was no information at all that it was anything other than a Graco crib that somehow had a wrong model number on it. So during that time, uh, you know, not only did additional children die in Simplicity Cribs, but millions more were made and put out into the consumer, uh, into consumer use, most of which are still in use today. Um, and there are still babies sleeping in these cribs that we know are dramatically unsafe. So for consumers, what's the information that they need and why do they need tracking labels? The first I've talked about a little. The crib that Danny died in was licensed with one brand but made by a different company. It's a, it's a continuing uh, pra uh, practice within the juvenile products industry as well as many other industries where the product, th the name that you see on the product is not the name of the company that made the product. Um, and so for consumers to be able to participate in recalls, we need accurate identifying information on the product of who the actual manufacturer was, not just the licensed name that's on it. In addition, some companies have different brand names for their own products. Um, and again, it's confusing. If you hear of a recall by one company when, in fact, that name does not appear to consumers anywhere on the product, you're going to have people not paying attention to the recall. And as I've mentioned with the simplicity, sometimes there's simply no labeling at all, and it's almost impossible to find out um, if your product uh, in the, is part of the recall or if you need to report a safety problem with it. I've seen recalls uh, for consumers to try and participate in where not only do they have to look in a particular place for where the brand name is and what shape the brand name is, because that might indicate a time difference. They have to look, obviously, for the serial number or model number, and in addition, maybe some other identifying feature, such as a different color part on it from the ones that were made later and were safe. That's really a lot to ask of a consumer when in one place you can have the information they need um, and I love the date idea, by the way. I think that's a great idea so that you can easily show uh, parents uh, where to get the information and how to participate in the recall. So we've ta I've talked a lot about recalls. That's obviously a very important issue to us because we know how ineffective recalls are and anything that makes them more effective, makes more people participate in them is very important. And our primary goal in making sure that tracking information is easily accessible on products. 
but it goes both ways too. We have a new uh, consumer database here in the United States where consumers can make complaints. We've heard concerns from companies that there's not accurate information, that the model number is sometimes left off, or that they misidentify the manufacturer. Having a tracking label will take care of that problem and make sure that that information on the, on the product um, in the database is as accurate as possible. Also, when they're reporting problems to the manufacturer, they can make sure they're, talking, they're both talking about the same product, they can get the appropriate replacement parts so that they don't end up putting on a part that doesn't adequately fit the product that they use. So for safety for consumers, we think that in a way to clearly identify the manufacturer of the product, the time, uh, what lot it was in is crucial for safety in the event that something goes wrong with the product. In addition, I think we, we've already talked about this. If you're putting, the, if one company is putting the uh, same component into numerous manufacturers' products, and something goes the matter with that component, we don't want just one manufacturer to catch it and fix it. We want to make sure that wherever that component is used, we can look at those products. Um, and, and the flip side of that is true. If you're using multiple suppliers for a part in your one manufacturer. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're able to identify which supplier's part is causing the problem and need to be replaced. Also, tracking labels will allow regulators to more accurately track products in corrective action, so we can have a better count of how many products have been uh, recalled, have, have been, parents have participated in the recall, we've gotten those products out of consumer use. Otherwise, we're just kind of dealing with nebulous numbers where we think maybe that product isn't still in use, but we really don't have accurate information. And I think it's already been mentioned that it also helps manufacturers to lessen the impact of a recall because you only have to recall the products uh, that are affected, not the broad group that, that kind of look like them, so that you want to make sure you get all of them. And finally, we think that there, um, as been mentioned, this requirement is only on children's products. We think obviously it would have a huge impact on other products as well to improve the recall effectiveness. We think that there's additional ways that manufacturers can use that information. The product registration system was, was mentioned again, that, that, uh, that requirement is named after Danny. We take it very seriously. We think that uh, the onus should be on the companies to make sure parents learn of recalls. One way to do that is to better um, promote and uh, encourage participation in product registration, and I think there's ways that tracking labels can be done, uh, can be used to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Our, our next presenter is Mark Ivanko. Uh, Mr. Ivanko is the Executive Vice President of Quality Assurance at uh, Doral, uh, Doral Juvenile Group, a leading manufacturer of juvenile products. Uh, pri prior to working for Durrell, uh, Mark worked in uh, for ACTS uh, testing labs where he managed their technical testing services for a, a wide range of products. He is a recognized expert in risk management, quality systems development, quality assurance, quality control, uh, technical testing services, and regulatory standards development. Uh, Mark Ivanko. He's coming. Yeah. Oh, there we go. We got probably cold. Is this is this you here? Oh, there it is. Okay. Oops. And no. That's it. Well, it's a good thing the engineers are back from yesterday. So. Um, good morning. It's certainly a privilege uh, to be here to be able to present to our distinguished Chinese guests, Ni Hao Ma, and uh, 
for the people in the South, Chosun. And, uh, but uh, it's really a privilege. Uh, you know, today's presentation talking about the best practices in tracking and labeling, certainly our panel members of, of Andy and Randall and Nancy have covered a lot of this scope today. So briefly, I want to cover some of the things they talked about, some other things they didn't talk about. So we'll be talking about what products are regulated, you know, what is required, Andy talked about it, where the labels required to be, the purpose of tracking labels, how are tracking labels connected to traceability, and I'll be giving you some examples of different types of labels that are on products that we use, and finally, why is it important to have tracking labels? Certainly, Andy talked about the products covered, children's products for children 12 years of age and younger. You need to have the manufacturer's name, address, contact information, data manufacturer, and then some sort of batch coding or a serial number or lot coding. Andy talked about where it should be. Well, it should be on the product and on the package. So why are tracking labels important to manufacturers? Well, as a best practice, the tracking label provides traceability if there's a quality issue, such as a recall. But furthermore, if you look at tracking labels, they build the foundation in concept for a comprehensive traceability system. You've heard our panel members talk about traceability. Well, for a manufacturer, it's very critical to have a comprehensive traceability system. It can trace products through distribution centers, through retailers. You can trace product and all its components. You can trace the product, its suppliers, its subcontractors. You can get down to the component level. And also, you can track back the materials. For this presentation, I kind of took a different approach to it. I'm going to use a lot of pictures. Certainly, your final product, in this case here, we have a master carton. We have two inner products that go on. Each individual goes on the shelf. But on our master carton, this two-pack, we have the model number out there. We have a purchase order, and often purchase orders are tied back to manufacturing lots the start of that traceability system. Well, you have your date code and other identification information. On the package itself, you have the required information. Who made it? Oh, we have something different here. We've put our 800 number for the consumers, because it's all about the consumers being able to contact the manufacturer if they have a concern about their product. So, on our packaging, we put our 800 number. We also put our web page, so they can also contact us through the internet. Now, these are not required, but certainly for us, they're a best practice. They're very optional, but they're a best practice, and everybody should consider using them. The other parts of the label, obviously, what is required. Here it is again, other packaging information, the model number, the date code, the manufacturer, where it was made. We also put on our products, not only the date code, but we have a supplier code. All our suppliers are coded, so we know exactly which manufacturer made this. I don't know if it comes out very well on the screen here, but here's a molded part. We actually mold in identifications into our major components that are made of plastic. All the required information is there, once again, we put in our supplier codes, and in this case here, it's a cavity number for further identification of the traceability system. Your tooling engineers can get creative about markings on products. Here you see a surface, a step down, step up type of surface. The tooling engineers can get really creative about really getting the right information on that product to help the consumers. Showed you a date wheel before. Very common in the industry, common in consumer products, the toy industry, juvenile industry. Certainly this product here, just for educational purposes, the product was made in May of 2011. Uh, date wheels come in all kinds of configuration sizes. Some are manual, very common in China, and some are automatic. 
because if you start looking at the surface area of your product, you can get creative about information for traceability. Here, we actually have a number on the mold that is tied right back to the engineering drawing and the engineering specification for that component. Kind of unique way of starting your traceability system. We have a batch code, and once again, traceability down to which cavity, because you need to know if you have a problem, you might have a two cavity mold, you may have a four cavity mold, or if you're making a lot of small components, you could have a 24 or a 32 cavity mold. You need to have an understanding where that problem's coming from. Often you hear <clears throat> comments about small components, small products, and how you can put markings on them. Here, this component's about the size of a golf ball. And you can see the different surface area, not a lot of surface area, but we're able to put in our vendor code because we want to get back to, to understand who our subcontractors are and who our vendors are and the cavity they're using. We're talking a lot about plastics and markings on plastic. Well, here's a stamp on aluminum, okay? You can stamp steel, but one of the things we don't typically do is we don't stamp steel because when you stamp it you actually damage the plating. When you damage the plating that area becomes a really very susceptible to rust. Other types of materials here on fabric we have a lot code, a date code. Also on fabric you can put small labels into the seams or you can use things like this care label We've put the model number on it, and on the back of it, we've put the date code on there that was sewn. Randall talked about UPC and barcoding. <clears throat> we use barcoding on certain labels. Certainly here, you see all the mandatory required information. But as a barcoding system, you can get very, very elaborate and what you're trying to track. You can be tracking purchase order, manufacturing date, supplier, component. You can even track, in this case here, the manufacturer of this label. We do barcoding on site. But the real key to using barcoding is if you have a product that has 10 major components to it, and each one has a barcode, you can go into the final assembly stage and scan each one of the barcodes into a final barcode, excuse me, and into a final barcode that gives the history of the product. We actually have scanning systems that are manual. We have automatic scanners for our certain barcodings because you have certain mandatory labels out there. And our systems are set up that if the, the final stage of barcoding is not completed with a scanner, the product can't move down the assembly line from there. It stops. So we use it as also a assurance for what we're trying to accomplish and make sure we have the mandatory labels there. Today's technology, you can actually, and you see it on some very expensive products out there, they have small computer chips. And that computer chip basically collects all of the data about that product almost to the point of a serial number, but in those computer chips, uh, the, it becomes a very small database of traceability. <clears throat> You've heard people talk about product registration cards. Obviously, it's another type of marking on there to help consumers contact us and for us to contact the consumers if there is a recall. As a best practice in quality systems, you really need to have traceability. You know, you, you heard our panel members talk about traceability. Well, sometimes in a simplified version of traceability and trying to explain it to non-technical people, you know, certainly uh, traceability and things of that sort becomes technical. But when you try to explain it to non-technical people, if you think of a tree, the trunk of a tree, and then as you go up the tree, you have large branches that go into small branches that go into twigs. Traceability works the same way. If you think of the trunk of the tree as the final product and you go up the tree, you go into your final assembly, you can go into the branches, into the component assembly. Randall showed you that manufacturing picture up there. A lot of components go into and a lot of activities go into manufacturing a product. 
So if you think about, in simple, simplified terms, going up the tree into the small branches, into the subcontractors, you can really get to the twigs. When you get to the twigs, you actually get to, gee, here are my components, here are my materials, here's my inks, here are my labels, here's my packaging material. You can track all the way back into it. How does it help a manufacturer? If you have a quality issue, one of the things you can do is reduce your cost of quality. No pun intended, you do a root cause analysis. Okay, <clears throat> so you do a root cause analysis and you basically are able to track through and trace that product and trace back into the componentry of that product. Ultimately, it does reduce your cost of quality. So why is it important to have tracking labels? <clears throat> well, obviously it assists us, the manufacturers, in locating the affected units <clears throat> in case of a quality issue or a recall. As a best practice, it be becomes the tracking label becomes the foundation for traceability that allows us to narrow down that issue, narrow it down to a certain date, a supplier, a manufacturer, a batch, a component, a material, minimizes the number of units out there, reducing the cost of quality. But really, the most really important piece of information about that tracking label is about the consumers. Tracking labels that are permanent, molded in, stamped in, permanent labels, don't get lost. Consumers can contact us, and we want consumers to contact us. We want consumers to contact us through our 800 number or our web page. Consumer feedback is critical to our business. When they call in, if they can give us more tracking information, it helps us identify the problem faster, helps us identify root cause faster. So we really treasure consumer feedback. Ultimately, gives us continuous improvement for the product. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. At this, at this point in time, I'd like to uh, um, open up the discussion to questions from the audience. Um, I've got a couple myself that I can uh, start with. Um, this one is for um, Ms. Cowles. Cur currently, uh, under the statute, manufacturers have a significant amount of flexibility when it comes to uh, the information that has to be contained on uh, on tracking labels. Um, in your view, should should the CPSC standardize the content and appearance of tracking labels, and 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 why or why not? Um, I think that the statute spells out the basic information that needs to be there, and I think that that is probably enough standardization. I mean, unless something changes, we actually think that the tracking labels can be used not only for um, getting uh, that specific information, uh, but unlike the product registration cards, which have to be very standardized so that consumers don't think they're marketing materials, you have more leeway with the tracking label. We'd like to see things like barcodes that the consumers could use or QR codes that they could use with their smartphones that would automatically take them to the registration page. So they bring your product home, snap a picture with their phone, uh, that takes them right to the page where they can fill out the product registration. Um, or, you know, I, I think that uh, Mark has given some excellent examples of additional information that's useful, useful to consumers. Any way that they can reach you more easily, identify the very specific product they have more easily, is going to keep, their, keep them safer and make sure that you can improve your product faster, do a recall faster if you do need to do that. Thank you. Do we have a question from the audience? Yes, thank you. Mark Knox, I'm with TV Rhineland, a third-party test lab. My question is for Mr. Gooden. He mentioned a unique and I think a very good idea of actually time and date stamping products as they go through the system and possibly also components. My question is twofold. One, do you have some resources you could point manufacturers to uh, for manufacturers of such types of label printers? And question two is how small can those labels be to your knowledge currently? Thank you. Well, two things. N no, I, I don't have, uh, uh, I didn't want to be promoting uh, certain uh, label making, 
uh, machine makers and stuff, and so I don't have the sources. Uh, it's, it's a simple enough concept. Uh, the, the, uh, as I would envision it, the, the role of labels would be going through the machine, would already have printed on it the manufacturer's name and a location, and it's just a timestamp that, that hits it, and the person peels it off and sticks it on. <clears throat> and, and the size of it, even the type of material that it would be, uh, would then uh, be different with different sizes of products and different types of products. So <clears throat> if you have, you know, you could have outdoor products, you could have products that are in windows, uh, uh, you, can, you can have uh, uh, small products and larger products. And so the size of the label, you know, I, I don't think that there's a, a size that, that uh, uh, I'd say that it has to be. Uh, but in all labels, even warning labels, uh, you run into the issue of is there surface for it to be applied, how much surface space do you have, and so how big of a label do you need to have. It's pretty simple in size, so it doesn't have to be too big. I'd like to add a few comments to that, um, just so uh, the audience knows. A good label supplier can give you all types of sizes of labels. For a time stamp on a label, we actually, on a number of our manufacturing lines, we have computers and systems right there. So they're actually printing out the entire label right on the assembly line. That gives you the ability to have instantaneous dating and timing on it. From a date coding point of view and molding, you can have automatic minute timers that are put in there. However, date coding instrumentation can tend to be very expensive, especially automatic date coders. Okay, so, but you can have date code um, instrumentation out there for minute, the day, the hour. Can they, they have a multitude of different options out there. I think we have another question from the audience. Good morning. Uh, Ann Weeks with Underwriters Laboratory, so I must confess my question is going to be more as a consumer and a recent mother of a 13-month-old. Um, it, it's interesting to hear about um, the tracking labels and how uh, different information appears on different parts of the product, the packaging, the product, the components. Um, what sort of education or communication uh, do manufacturers or CPSC or other stakeholders, um, how do you help educate consumers about that information and how to, to, to leverage it uh, when needed. You know, I, I think about the purchase of a product and what information is on the packaging versus the product and not parent, a lot of parents not retaining packaging what might have vital information, so. I'll, I'll just start real quick and I, I will say that the information on the tracking label, um, other than the idea I just had about the, or gave about the product registration, is actually information that consumers should not need. So that information, until there's a problem with the product, either that they need to call someone to report or it's been recalled, it's there for, for that purpose. So, um, you know, but in terms of, you know, it's a concern that we do have that, that information, instruction books or uh, warning labels that are only in the instructions or on the packaging are, you can just assume that parents are not keeping that packaging. Sometimes parents might not even see that packaging if they get a gift and someone's already taken it out of the packaging to give it to them, set it up, you know, you give a new mother a, a, a play yard or something in the, at the shower and they've already taken it out of the box and set it up for kind of as a surprise. And so I think that the more information that's available either on the product itself um, or attached to the product in some way. Just like with cribs, we have the requirement that that instruction information, all that information, have a way to permanently stay with the product. So depending on the size of your product, that's another thing to look for. I think that, you know, we often, I think it was given in the talk yesterday, rely on consumer education for safety, and it's really way down the list. If you're relying on, on consumers, being extremely well educated about everything that's on your product for safety, you're going to end up having problems. And so it's, you know, these are for, this is information for when there is a problem um, and shouldn't be what you're relying on to keep the consumer safe from the product to start with. I might add to that. The, 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 uh, uh, and, and what you're really getting down to is adequate warnings. Uh, 
in my circle, I talked about product liability prevention. One of the largest causes of product liability lawsuits are lack of adequate warnings and instructions on the product. Um, as Nancy had just mentioned, you don't have the manuals anymore. It can be any consumer product. And, and we're, once you understood how the thing works, out goes the uh, manual. So the warnings can't be there. Uh, the the uh, uh, safety warning and hazardous warnings uh, and as much instruction as possible should be right on the product, be labeled on the product. But, you, but manufacturers have a duty to warn. And, and so the warning uh, and the conspicuousness of the warning has to be on the product, not contained in some manual someplace. And so that's the, that in the safety hierarchy that was uh, mentioned yesterday, that's the duty of the manufacturers to make sure that that's there and it's right there where the hazard could take place or the uh, danger, the potential danger uh, they could be exposed to takes place. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask the final question of the panel. Um, uh, at, the, at the CPSC, we find a s significant number of, of violative products that uh, come into the ports um, also don't have, um, uh, don't, don't have tracking labels. I'd like to ask Mr. Ivanko, um, if he has any insight as to the reasons why we're not seeing uh, um, tracking labels on a significant number of the, the, the products that we're sampling at the ports, and uh, if he has any suggestions as to what can be done to uh, address that problem. Well, hopefully it's not our product. Um, but uh, I think what it comes down to is we go to great lengths to educate our suppliers on the requirements um, we do symposiums with our suppliers in China to educate them on new requirements. I think a lot of it has to do with are you purchasing overseas goods uh, that are finished products or you're actually uh, doing some designing and manufacturing over there where you have control. We control a lot of our information, most of our information through engineering products product specifications, so we specify the information has to be on the product and has to be on the package. But I would encourage more education of the, of the vendors over there, the subcontractors, certainly smaller uh, Chinese vendors do not, are not aware of a lot of the regulations out there, and I think that's an opportunity. Thank you. Well, I think this has been a, a very um, informative presentation regarding um, issues surrounding tra uh, tracking labels and traceability and, and best practices and um, the benefits of, of traceability from both the, the consumer and the manufacturer's standpoint. And I'd like to again thank uh, our panelists for their uh, insights. Thank you. Thank you.